I would like to compare the standard form of Newton's second law with the relativistic form. Here's the standard form of Newton's second law, f equal ma, and we can take this equation and we can solve it for a by multiplying both sides by 1 over m. So we'll get a is equal to 1 over m times f. And what this equation tells you is that if you have a mass m and there's a force f acting on it, you're going to have an acceleration in the same direction as the force, but scaled by this factor 1 over m. And the acceleration vector can be shorter than f or longer than f, depending on whether 1 over m is smaller than 1 or greater than 1. And you can see from the equation that a only depends on m and f and there's no dependence on the speed and no dependence on the velocity. So A is independent of the state of motion of the particle. Now you can take the equation F equals MA and you can write it as F is equal to M times dV dt, since A is equal to dV dt. Now M is a constant, so you can bring it inside the derivative and have d dt is equal to MV. But MV is just the momentum, so the equation is equivalent to f is equal to dp dt. Now, in order to get the relativistic version of Newton's second law, I'm going to use two equations from special relativity, the relativistic momentum, p is equal to m gamma v, and the relativistic, relativistic energy, e is equal to m gamma c square. Now, in order to get the relativistic form, all you do is take Newton's law in this form, over here and replace the p by the relativistic momentum m gamma v. And written like this with p defined like this, this is the first version of the relativistic form of Newton's second law that I'm going to derive. And the gamma factor in this equation is equal to a function of speed and it's equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c square. So you can see from this expression that when v is equal to 0, the gamma factor is just equal to 1. And when v increases, this ratio increases, so the denominator gets smaller, so gamma gets larger. And when v is equal to c, this ratio will be equal to 1, so you'll have a 0 in the denominator, and you'll have a vertical asymptote at v equals c. So as v approaches c, the gamma factor will tend towards infinity. And you can also see from the diagram that gamma is always greater than or equal to 1. Now what I would like to do is solve this equation for a. So we have f is equal to dp dt <clears throat> with p equal to the relativistic momentum. And now what I'd like to do is expand this term with the product rule. So I'll have d dt of m gamma times v plus m gamma times dv dt. But dv dt is just equal to the acceleration, which is what I'm looking for. So what I'll do is take this term and move it over to the other side of the equation. So I'll have m gamma times dv dt is equal to f minus this term, and I'll write the velocity first, so I'll have minus v times d dt of m gamma. And what I would like to do now is to use the equation for the relativistic energy to substitute this term for a term that will be more useful. And in order to do that, I'd like to digress for a moment to clarify the meaning of this expression. If gamma is, if, if v is equal to zero in this expression for the gamma factor, gamma is going to be equal to one. So E is just going to be equal to mc square. And that's just the rest energy of the particle. Now, if v is greater than zero, then the gamma factor will be greater than one. And the value of this expression is going to have increased. But the increase is just going to be due to the motion of the particle so that in general the relativistic energy is equal to the rest energy mc square plus the kinetic energy. Now suppose you have a mass and it's moving along a trajectory like this from point 1 to point 2 and you have a force f acting on it and dr represents an infinitesimal of displacement. Then at 
then an infinitesimal of work is going to be equal to f dot dr. But you can take dr and you can multiply it and divide it by dt, the increment of time that corresponds to dr. Then dr dt is going to be equal to v. So dr can be written as v times dt. So I'll take this term and I'll replace it by v times dt. And then I'll just regroup the terms like this. Now I'll just divide both sides by dt, so I'll get dw dt is equal to f dot v. And this equation says that the rate at which the force does work on the particle is just equal to f dot v. Now we know that work is not just force times distance, work is also the transfer of energy. So if a force does an increment of work dw on a particle, there's a corresponding change in energy dE. Now I can take this equation and I can divide both sides by dt, where dt is just the increment of time corresponding to dw. Now we have dw dt, but we saw that dw dt was just equal to f dot v, so I can replace this term by f dot v, and I can take the right side of the equation and replace the e by m gamma c square. So this term over here becomes this. Now the c square is a constant, so I can take the c square outside the derivative and have c square times d dt of m gamma is equal to f dot v. But this is just the term we were looking for. So what I can do is just multiply both sides of this equation by 1 over c square and get d dt of m gamma is equal to 1 over c square f dot v. And here's the equation we had before. So now I can take this term and I can replace it by this. So this expression will become this and this equation will become this equation. Now what I can do is I can take the c square over here and I can put one of the c's under this v and one of the c's under this v. So this term will become this and this term will become this and this equation becomes this equation. <coughs> now what I would like to do is define a beta equal to v over c and this is a normalized velocity. So this term becomes beta and this term becomes beta and I'd like to write dv dt as a, so this equation will become this equation. So now I can just solve for a by multiplying both sides of this by one over gamma m. So we'll get a is equal to one over gamma m times this expression from here. And this equation is the second version of uh, the relativistic form of Newton's second law. And you can see from this equation that now a is not just dependent on m and f, it's also dependent on the speed through the gamma factor and the velocity through beta. So now A is also dependent on the state of motion of the particle. Now what I would like to do is define an f effective equal to this term and then substitute this term by f sub e so this equation becomes this. Now an example of the situation described by this equation would be this. You have a mass m moving along a trajectory. It's got a force f acting on it and has beta in the direction of the velocity since beta is equal to v over c. Now in this example the force is tipped forward so the angle between here and here is less than 90 degrees so f dot beta is positive. So f dot beta doesn't affect the direction of this vector. But you have a minus sign over here, which flips f effective back in this direction like this. So if you have an f effective, if you have an f tipped forward like this, you have an f effective back like this. And this also includes the case when f is parallel to beta along here. You also have an f effective back like this. Now, if f were tipped back, the angle between beta and f would be greater than 90, and f dot beta would be negative and that negative would cancel with this negative, and then you'd have an f effective in the forward direction. So if you have f tipped forward, you have an f effective back like this, and if you have f tipped back, you have an f effective in the forward direction. 
And in order to get the relativistic acceleration, you have to add f plus f effective. And the way to add vectors geometrically is take the tail of one and move it to the tip of the other. So you'll have an f over here and a copy of f effective over here. And the sum will be the vector from here to here. And you can see from the equation that the relativistic acceleration scales along the direction of the sum. So the relativistic acceleration will now be along this vector. And it can be shorter than that vector or longer than that vector, depending on the size of the scale factor. And this is in contrast to the classical acceleration, which is always along the direction of the force, according to the classical equation of the motion. So one of the main differences between the relativistic acceleration and the classical acceleration is that the relativistic acceleration in general is not along the direction of f. Now, there are two special cases when even relativistically, the acceleration is along the, re the direction of f. For example, if f were pointed in like this, the angle between beta and f would be 90 degrees, so f dot beta would be zero. So this would be zero, and this term would be zero, and a would just scale along the direction of f and also be inward. The other special case would be if f was along this tangent line here. For example, if f were forward like that, you would have an f effective back like this. But you can show that the magnitude of f effective is always smaller than the magnitude of f. So the net is going to be in the forward direction, which means that the relativistic acceleration is also in the forward direction. Now, if f were back like this, you would have an f effective like this, and the net would also be back, so a would also be back in that direction. And another thing you can see from this diagram is that the normal component of F and the normal component of the composite force are both the same. And that would be the vector from here to here, if I consider a component as a vector. So this vector over here is the same as this vector over here, and F sub C is just F plus F effective, the composite force. But since you also have an f effective back like this, and it's along a line which is parallel to this tangent line over here, the tangential component of the composite force is only from here to here, whereas the tangential component of the force alone is from here all the way to here. So the magnitude of the tangential component of the force, which is this distance from here to here, is going to be greater than the magnitude of the tangential component of the composite force, which is only this distance from here to here. Now I can take this term and I can multiply it on the inside by 1 over m. And I can take this term and multiply that on the inside by 1 over gamma m. But 1 over gamma m is smaller than 1 over m, so this inequality will still hold. Now this term, 1 over m times the tangential component of force will be the tangential component of the classical acceleration that we get from this equation. And this term, 1 over gamma m times the tangential component of the, of the composite force will be the tangential component of the relativistic acceleration that we get from this equation. So the inequality tells us that <clears throat> the magnitude of the tangential component of the classical acceleration is greater than the magnitude of the tangential component of the relativistic acceleration. And that's important because the tangential component of acceleration is equal to dv dt, which is the change in speed per time. So what this term is doing is it's reducing the magnitude of the tangential component of acceleration relative to the classical case. And when you reduce the magnitude of this, you reduce the magnitude of this. But reducing the magnitude of dv dt is equivalent to resisting changes in speed. So this term is actually an inertial term <coughs> which resists changes in speed, which a force would try to impose on a particle. Now, a consequence of the special theory of relativity is that you can't accelerate a particle to the speed of light. So when you make the transition from the classical equation to the relativistic equation, 
you get these two extra inertial terms over here and over here, and the effect of those terms is to prevent the mass from be ex being accelerated to the speed of light. For example, if V were to approach C, this gamma factor would go to infinity so that A sub R would approach zero. Now, before ending, I'd like to just point out two things. Since the expression for the relativistic, since this is the expression for the relativistic acceleration that we just derived, as beta approaches zero, which can happen as v approaches zero or c approaches infinity, the gamma factor will approach one and this term will approach zero. So the relativistic acceleration will just approach one over m times f. But one over m times f is just the classical acceleration. So as beta approaches zero, the relativistic acceleration will approach the classical acceleration. And that shows you that special that shows you that shows you that classical mechanics is just a limiting case of relativistic mechanics. And I would also like to point out that both the equation f equal dp dt with p equal to the relativistic momentum and the expression for the acceleration that we just derived are both versions of the relativistic form of Newton's second law. And one of these versions may be more useful than the other, depending on the situation.